Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gradual today, which is the graduals always are for a season, and so the season is of Holy Week. So this is the gradual that we have today, and uh, for Palm Sunday, if we had a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday services, which some churches do, it would be the same gradual. When you come Thursday and Friday night, it's the same gradual, which sort of sets the tone uh, for the week. As it says, Christ entered once for all into the holy places by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. And as reflected from the epistle lesson today, the verse for today, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But Palm Sunday was a glorious time. It was a wave those palm branches and shout Hosanna, which means uh, save us now, save us now. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel, which is not what it said in the psalm. I don't know if you picked up on that, but it was, they added it to it. And, and in some of the gospels, they didn't put that in there because it's a misquote of the psalm that we, that we read. But it gives you an idea of, of where their mindset was because this was what they call a coronation psalm. This is the psalms that were read when they got a new king coming into, into Jerusalem to rule the kingdom of Judah or uh, in the south. And they probably used it in the north as well. But anyway, uh, but this was the coronation psalm from the time of David. This was a glorious time. And in fact, uh, hopefully, hopefully you noticed uh, many of those uh, verses. The thing it said, uh, uh, let's see. Why did I have that doing anything? Oh, thank you. It answered me. This is the Lord's doing. Bless you. Uh, no, that was from the intro. Whatever. Anyway, the, the oh. Boy, did I get my back mixed up on that one, on that one. Where is that one? I have a, my notes are so complete here. That, oh, that was from, oh, it is from 118, but from other parts of it. There we go. All right. The, 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 psalm, that we, uh, the, the psalm that we read was from verse 19 to so forth. That same psalm has other familiar texts in it that were uh, in the uh, thing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you, O Lord. Okay, the Psalm 24 which is also a coronation. It says the, uh, uh, that describes better what the psalmist, what the, those who are quoting the psalms, what they expected of their kings. And, and so the question we're asking tonight is, who's coming? Well, in the intro of today, it begins to give us an idea of what they expected because this is a coronation. It says, uh, you know, this is a parade. And it was quite a parade because it was coming, if you recall, from Bethsaida, uh, east of Jerusalem, that comes by the Mount of Olives and down in the valley and then comes up to Jerusalem to enter into the gates. Well, there was a crowd from Bethsaida because that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. And Lazarus had just recently died and Jesus had just come and raised him from the dead. So you can imagine, that, you know, uh, faith healers that can raise somebody that's been in the grave for three days already, that kind of spreads news around as to what kind of king they have coming to Jerusalem. And so the word, uh, that, that crowd that was gathered there in, in uh, uh, Bethsaida and so forth, uh, east of Jerusalem, they came with the disciples and with Jesus down through the valley and come back up into Jerusalem. Now, this was the time of the Passover, so there were people from the outer realms and hence between the Jerusalem and there from the Hebrews, Jews from all over the place coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And it could have been as many as a quarter of a million people 
camped around all over town and all over the place where they go. So it was a crowd. And so they ask, they see this parade coming, they say, who's coming? Who's coming? And they say, the king is coming. The king is coming. King? What king? Well, it's, we think he's the Messiah. He raised, raised from the dead. I mean, that's, just imagine what other kind of things that he could do. I mean, he could fix the famines. He can fix our other health issues. He can, he can take care of, well, that's what they said. And it says the, in, the, in the intro today, uh, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Of course we want somebody that could come in and fight our, war, fight our battles for us, Right? That's what we do when we pray to the Lord, right? <laughs> Lord, come fight this battle for me. Come fix this for me. Yeah. Well, and then a lot of people, they, they, they pray that. Uh, maybe you have on occasion. Prayed something, and it didn't work out that way. You know, your prayer was not answered. This mighty, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, om the present God couldn't fix your problem. Well, we heard in the midweek services about Joseph, and this past week and week before, they said we learned of Joseph's patience because he waited about 13 years from the time that he languished in prison, but he held on to hope. And then, because God had a plan, we studied last Wednesday night. God has a plan. It may not be our plan, it's His plan. And His plan may be entirely different than our plan. But God has a plan for you. He has called you, as He said, He has called you to be His servant. Go back and take a look at that. There's several times that the servant comes up. It's not, you know, subjects. We're servants of God. We're serving God in everything. That's our job. That's our task as his children, his people, is to serve God. That was the problem with the people of Israel throughout their history, is that they forgot who they served. When they finally, you know, from the time of the judges, and they wanted a king like all the others had, you know, they wanted a king. And God said, you, know, well, you don't know what you're asking. It's not in my plan. Uh, I would just as soon rule you. You like it? You won't like a king. He's going to do things like tax you. You're going to have to be part of his army. You're going to have to, uh, you know, pay all sorts of taxes. And and it was said that. And and you're going to have to serve uh, in 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 the army on a rotational basis all your life and your your prime years and and so forth and so on. And and it's just it's you're just not going to like it. And so they complained. They complained under Moses as they were leaving slavery in Egypt. And they, and, and they, they weren't out even a couple of days. And they say, what is this? Are you going to bring us out here in the desert to, to, to starve to death? Where's, you know, where's the food? Where's the water? You know, what, what's your supply train? How are we going to get fed? And how are we going to do that? And Moses says, okay, God, uh, it's bad publicity to bring all these people out here and let them die. Well, two generations worth of them did. And they had trouble because they kept looking back at the good times they remember in slavery. They had fruits and vegetables and meat, fish, and other kind and, and and meat and other kinds of meat, all sorts of stuff. They had they had all of their needs were met so that they could do all the slave work that the Egyptians wanted them to do. And they remembered all the good stuff, but they forgot about all the trampling in the mud and the straw to make bricks and so forth and so on, day after day after day. They could they complain. And you remember when well, they complained that they had no water? And you remember, because it plays in today's text, it says, uh, God told Moses about a, a particular rock. He says, this is rock. He goes, strike that rock, and the water will flow to feed all the people and all the flocks that you brought out with them. And they're good. And, and then uh, later on, you recall that they were complaining about, uh, they were always complaining about something. 
But again, they were complaining about another place where the water wasn't any good and not enough and whatever. And God says, well, the rock is there. And he told Moses to speak to the rock. And the rock would give them. See, because in the New Testament, we know about who that rock was. That rock was Jesus. And he is only supposed to be split once. And then after that, when you need him, you speak to him. Moses, he had the habit, he was into it, a big thing, you know, last time he struck the rock, he struck the rock the second time. When God tells us to do something and gives us detailed instructions, that's what Joshua later had to learn. When they followed Joshua's directions and instructions from God, they won battles. When they didn't follow him to the letter, they lost the battle. Moses lost the blessing of after 40 years of leading this stiff-necked people. That's what Scriptures call them. They're talking about us, too. He disobeyed God, and he was prevented from going, leading them all the way to the east bank of the Jordan River, but not to go into the promised land. And because of everything, everyone who left Egypt over the age of 20, except Joshua probably, died in the wilderness. So when they finally got there, here was Moses, 120 years of age, twice as old, approximately about twice as old as anybody else he's been leading for 40 years that's still left. And this is what he the last chapter of De the whole book of Deuteronomy is his remember these things folks this is how God has instructed us to live as a people as his people this is this is how God's people live which included the parts from Exodus that all and Leviticus and all of that it was a, it was a, a refresher course and and then then he comes to you know to what he said in in the uh, in, in the Old Testament reading, it says, because they're feeling, you know, we're stuck out here in the wilderness now, or whatever. It says, the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. They had been complaining against Moses and his brother Aaron and everybody else in between, and, and God particularly. And he says, God, you know, because... For one thing, there were guerrilla fighters all around them, the Amalekites, I think it was. Uh, and, and they kept attacking them and just pestilizing, just all sorts. Of, and, and the food and the whatever. And, and, and they don't talk much about the manna that God provided every morning so they had food enough. And then the, the, the birds that came every night so they had meat and, and bread and, and God provided water from the rock that was following them and all sorts of stuff. But no. So he said, the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free, when all hope is lost, the Lord will vindicate his people. And then God will say, and why, why, why is everything gone? It's because people don't pay attention to God. They look to everything else to answer our prayers. They look to themselves if they are self-made people. They look to the resources that they have accomplished and that they have acquired to, to fix things that are broken and, and the servants, that they, whatever. It's, they don't turn to God. And if they have turned to God, they don't return to Him in thanks. That's what the story, after they finally conquer the, the promised land under the time of the judges and they get to the time of the kings and up through uh, Saul, it didn't work out too well, and then David and, Saul, and uh, Solomon 
And then that was the end of the kingdom because it, they had civil war and you had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah and stuff. And there were all the, that's why God sent the prophets to say, you're, mess, pay it, you're putting your faith and your trust in things besides God. And when you look at the Old Testament and, and the kind of things that God says, the, the prophets and Moses and everybody is telling them and says, you're not paying attention to God. You're not worshiping. You're not bringing your offerings to the place that you call upon God's name. They didn't emphasize the fact that you could do it anywhere you wanted to. They particularly said, here's the tabernacle. Here's the tent of meeting. Here's finally a temple. Here's the temple in Jerusalem. Here's where you come to call upon the name of the Lord. Here's where you offer your your." Your tithes and your offerings, your thank offerings, your blessing offerings, all those kind of things uh, that you just uh, harvest, uh, you, uh, everything that you bring to God with your prayers in, in worship together. My servants come to worship and pray together and offer their tithes and offerings together in the house of prayer where you call upon the Lord's name. As we do come to call upon the Lord's name first for forgiveness so that our prayers and our offerings are acceptable to him because we recognize that we are sinners and that we need his forgiveness because otherwise we have nothing that's of any value in time, much less eternity. But by God's blessing and help, he gives us what we need here in time and more than we need in eternity. But as as and that explains a little bit, because as, as Moses continues, where uh, God says to the people who are complaining because uh, they, uh, uh, there's nothing left, and, and then he will say, God says, where are their gods? The rock in which they took refuge. That's rock with a lowercase r. Uh, ESV does a pretty good job on that point. It's about nine times in this sections of, of Deuteronomy that he mentions a rock. And where it's in capital R, then that's reference to Christ from the New Testament. Where it's a little r, that's all. And listen to what he says. Where are their gods? The rock in which they took refuge. Whatever it is that you look to to save yourself. And by the way, who is coming? Who is coming? We get into that. Uh, on a four-year cycle, at least, and sometimes a two-year cycle, a uh, mid midterm kind of thing, where we uh, often are looking for a new king. Well, we call them presidents. Okay. And, and we're always looking for the new president, or at least a renewal uh, by the old president, if we want to re-elect him, because he's giving us concepts and ideas that he's going to make things better. He knows how to do it now. He's in there. He knows how to accomplish that. Or they're throwing it right. And, it's, it's, you know, it's, and we're always looking for the king to fix things. But the kings aren't the ones who fix things. God fixes things. And so you look to him. But it takes trust that he is working on it. And secondly, it takes the patient to wait for when he has done it. Like Joseph had to wait. But he says... Uh, God gets a little sarcastic. Uh, he says, where are their gods, the rock in which they took right? Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? See, when they brought them to the temple of these other gods, they expected that this was presented to the gods to eat. Of course, really, it was the priests, or they sold the meat and stuff in a, in a butcher shop that just happened to be in the back of all these temples to all these gods that they're worshiping. So who ate all this? It wasn't the idols. They didn't eat. They, didn't, not, they were nothing. He says, and then God says, okay, there you go. Uh, let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. Uh, so it says, see now. That I, God says, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Talk about the good hands. Those are the good hands of God. Those are the best hands to be held by. Because God says, I will deliver you from all calamity. And he's talking about the calamity of eternal damnation 
All the rest of the stuff is just peripheral piffle that we go through in life because of sin. Ours and others and the natures of being affected by that. God has fixed everything for us. He even expresses it to, to help us understand that we won't even see death. We may go through the process, and it may not be all that uh, joyful. It may be extremely painful. But look what Jesus went through. His only begotten son. He gave his son something that he didn't... He asked it of Abraham, but he didn't take Isaac. He sent a ram to take his place. God the Father sent his only begotten son to take everybody's place. Whether they were called by God or not, Jesus died for all sins for all people. And that's what this, the latter part of the week, and Christ's passion and, and, and presses upon us. But it's God is working all of these things. And, and uh, so we say, save us the Hosanna. Hosanna, which is save us, we pray. Hosanna, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. He gives it to us as a gift out of his Mercy, by not giving us the immediate damnation that we deserve, but out of His grace, He gives us what we do not deserve, which is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You know, the Lord is God, and He has made His light to shine upon us. Uh, to fix everything, let's go. Because you're my God, and I will give thanks to you. You're my God, I will extol you. And then it says that what I was looking for. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast mercy endures forever. And, and the other one that I was looking for, it's not highlighted on this one. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, and so forth. This is, you know, this is from the Psalms. And some pieces of these you may have in your memory. Or a memory bank of old, or, or perhaps, hopefully, of the new time. Because it's those kind of things that keep us going. And, and, and Paul, as he writes to the Philippians, and tells us what Jesus has done in his humility. Uh, being found in human form, like, oh, what is this? Whoo, wow. This is what you guys go through all the time? Mm, mm, mm. You know, it hurts when I stomp my toe or when I take that hammer of dad's and I miss the, putting the things together in his carpentry shop and I hit my hand. Oh, he didn't do that. He did everything purpose. <laughs> he did it, everything perfectly. Uh, maybe he doesn't know it. Yes, he does. Well, he does. Being tempted by the devil, he did not eat for 40 days and 40 nights. I know kids rarely can get home from school without starving to death. I'm talking about homeschoolers from the table over there to the table over here. I'm starving. What do we got to do? You know, because that's our sinful nature. And we cannot escape that in time. God helps us to live with it. Not only in time, but for eternity. He gives us a glorified body. He glorified his son. Why? He glorified, one more, there you got. He glorified his son. Just inside the back cover of the bulletin today, there are, what, five illustrations? There are five illustrations. Please take note of which one had the full page. The small one's five on the left. His entry into Jerusalem in humility. Monday, Thursday, the institution of which we'll celebrate on Thursday evening. The institution of this is my body, this is my blood. And then the procession out to the cross. Not even able to carry, probably not the whole thing, just the cross beam even on his shoulders because he'd been beaten. And then he hung from the cross for three hours until it was finished and he gave up his spirit. And even the glory of the sunrise service and the resurrection. But he is glorified in the illustration on the right. He is glorified hanging on the cross. We have another corpus that we put after, uh, for Easter on the cross for the rest of the year. That is his glorified body. But this is his body in its highest glory of moment and time. 
on the cross where he accomplished the salvation, where he accomplished his robe of righteousness that he gives to us. In our baptism, we are joined to him in his baptism, in his death, in his resurrection, and his burial. And he gives us the robe of righteousness that we might attend, be raised to life everlasting with him, and have the wedding garments for the eternal wedding feast in heaven. He gives us that. We don't make it. We don't earn it. We receive it as a total gift. And he gives us that and says, come to my wedding banquet. And that's what now we are waiting. Who's coming? Well, as a congregation, we're waiting to hear too. Who's coming? Who's coming? When? Who's coming finally, ultimately, is Jesus. We don't know when about that either. He may come before our other question of who's coming is answered. But that's the second one is the one that we're always waiting for. Jesus is coming to take us from here to eternity with God in heaven. That is such, such, we will to be glorified. Not our glory, his glory. And there is no greater glory. And God is Lord of Lord, God of gods. He is our rock and our salvation. He fights the battles for us. Jesus already fought for us and beat Satan. He sends his Holy Spirit to help us fight those battles in our time. And he does help us. He also gives us the patience when God does not seem to be near us anymore. And we're asking, God, please help me. He sometimes lets us fall to our knees so that we look up to him and that he's the source of all our good things in life. Sometimes we really have to wait. That's a middle-class ideal, you remember. Waiting on the Lord. It's not fun. It's not easy. But the retirement program is <laughs> unbeatable. Talk about a golden parachute. Wow. He sends his angels to take us to be with him. And all God's people say,